City Line Online. We're so glad you're here. We want you to know that this is the perfect place for imperfect people. Today, you're going to hear some amazing worship, engaging teachings, and learn how you can stay connected. Let's get ready to celebrate. Hello, City Line. We are so excited to be worshiping with you on the first Sunday of the new year. So I just want to invite you to stand as we get ready to sing. See 
Hey City Line friends and family, Happy New Year. We are so thrilled that you are tuning in to this online experience. Me and my friends, we're excited for today because we believe that God wants to speak 
directly into your life. In fact, you probably know some people in your life that, that probably could use this feed today as well. So why don't you tag them, maybe text them, let them know that we are live right now and that you would love for them to join you for church. As we continue to worship God together, one of the ways that we do that is through our giving. We choose to put God first in our life uh, by giving to Him first. So we invite you to practice generosity. And we thank you for your generosity. Because of the way that you give, it enables us to continue to do the work of ministry in and through this church and in our local communities. Let's worship the Lord together.
just want you forget about you God when this world is just so crazy and I forget that I can just come back and sit down with you and just soak up in your presence God God I thank you for this year even though it was hard for so many reasons but I still thank you for being faithful. And I thank you for everything that you've done to help us become closer to you and to remind us of what you can do. And God, I pray that you just help us refocus our eyes this upcoming year and that we don't forget to just sit down and be caught up in your presence, God because all that matters is you. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name. What's happening, City Line friends and family? So thrilled to have you joining us on the very first Sunday of 2021. I mean, we say it all the time, there is no better way to start your day than right here with City Line Church. And today, I'm telling you, you picked an incredible day to join us because today we're doing a little something called Six and Six for the New Year. And I know some of you, uh, you're not familiar with that, so let me just explain. What's going to happen today is you are going to hear from six different communicators. They've all been given six minutes apiece to drop you some really important nuggets for the new year, right? I want you to take notes, right? Because when I say nuggets for the new year, I'm telling you, 
What they want to do is they want to speak into your life. They want to speak into your situation. They, they want to speak what God has placed on their heart. I, I've asked them to think through something that they've learned in 2020, or I've asked them to think about a way to encourage you as you move forward into 2020. 21. And, and so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get ready. I'm going to ask you to take out something to write with. I'm going to ask you to open up your heart to God and let's continue to lean into what he wants to do in and through us as we approach this new year. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I need to help you know who's coming and when. So, so here's what you're going to hear, right? At the beginning of each round, you're going to hear this. That's right. It's the bell ringing, right? It's like, hey, we're ready to go. We're coming out hot. But at the end of their six minutes, as they start, start to wrap up, just so you know when a transition is happening, you're also going to hear this. Right, I, I know, I know, it sounds crazy. It's not to make them feel weird, make them feel bad. It's not to make them feel strange or anything like that. It's just to help you know that, hey, buckle up because there's more coming. All right, let's get into it. Let's have some fun. Let's worship God together. about y'all but I have done a ton of movie marathons during quarantine especially those superhero adventure kinds like Star Wars, Avengers, Harry Potter and something I noticed about these films is that they all revolve around the same narrative of good versus evil and in this battle at some point the characters will come across a hopeless situation and suddenly the good guys look like they're defeated and all hope seemed lost. But what's interesting to me is for most of us, we can look at that and immediately conclude that that's not the end of the story. When we left that movie theater after watching Avengers Infinity Wars and all of our favorite superheroes were defeated and Thanos, the bad guy, looked like he was winning, when that movie ended right there, we knew that the story was not over. And even though we were unsure of how the story would unfold, even though we were unsure how many lives would be lost, even though we were unsure of the struggle that they'd have to go through to get to the victory, we all anticipated at some point in the next movie, hope will be found, light will shine, and the good guys, they're going to win. 2020 left many of us feeling like that hopeless part of the movie, feeling defeated. And you've probably lost a lot unexpectedly, maybe lost a job or maybe loved ones. Maybe you felt exhausted feeling like it's a never ending battle. Maybe you found yourself asking and praying for things just not to be seem like it wouldn't be answered. And if you're anything like me, you'd probably found yourself angry, confused, frustrated, maybe crying a little bit more than you probably have before. It's been a really hard year. But can I tell you that just as we knew that the Avengers movie, the Infinity Wars movie wasn't over, your story is not over. In the Bible, Abraham, Moses, Job, Joseph, David, Daniel, Paul, you name them all, all of them at some point, they had a moment where they found themselves at a place where it seemed like all hope is lost. In fact, probably the most hopeless looking situation we've ever had in the history of humanity was when Adam and Eve chose to go against God and brought sin and darkness into the world. Like, can you imagine what a loving God must have felt to look at his creation captivated by darkness, to look at his beloved creation dying and separated from him. But when all seemed lost, God made a way when there was no way and light and hope entered the scene and Jesus came to save. If we were in the movie theater, this is the part where we're all clapping and cheering because the good guys are about to win. And you could say that we're all part of this movie or God's story. And in this story, the light always wins. It can never be defeated by darkness. In fact, as the word says in John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And the good news is this part right here in your life where it feels 
like all hope seems lost, it is not the end because Jesus is the light and the light is for you. Church, there is no situation that is hopeless with God. There is no situation too far gone that God can't help us with. In fact, if that situation seems too big or too far gone for him, then that situation has become greater to you than God. But that's a different topic for a different day. If I can just encourage you now, in 2021, the new year, it's this, Romans 8:18. 8, the pain that you've been feeling cannot compare to the joy that's coming. That means the best is yet to come. But in the meantime, what do we do? Well, one, we run to the Father. We pray first, we find comfort in Him. Two, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We focus on Him first and His truth. And three, we hope. We hope in the Lord. And as Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You know that part in the movie where the good guy starts rising up and one by one, they find hope. And of course, John Williams' movie score just gets louder and it just gets you right here in the fields. You guys, that could be us. Church, we have a better hope. We simply need to hold on to it. So go ahead in 2021, allow yourself to have hope. You know how this story ends. And if you don't, spoiler alert, the good guys win, because God always wins. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rich Rollins. My wife, Luann, and I have been involved with CityLine for a couple of years, and what a great blessing it's been to be involved with a church that has an active interest in the community and is trying to reach out. And we've been personally and corporately blessed uh, being involved in this ministry. Pastor Jack asked a couple of weeks ago if I would say something uh, encouraging as we enter another year of uh, turbulence. and. My very first thought went to Romans chapter 15, verse 13, where Paul writes a little teeny prayer as he's closing out a letter to these believers in Rome. And he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you might overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. What a great little prayer Paul sends up for this church. And I think it's so... Um, apropos to where we're at today as a church and as a people. We've been through probably one of the most um, hectic times known on this planet in the history of mankind with respect to disease. We're a divided country. Uh, many of us have lost jobs. Uh, we've lost homes. We've lost loved ones. We've lost loved ones where we couldn't even go to a funeral. We couldn't be with them in the hospital. Um, our, uh, our country and our people and this world has encountered a difficulty that it's never encountered before globally. And so we could look at these circumstances and be without great hope, be without joy, and be without peace. But Paul brings to us a hope in a prayer when he says that if we trust in God, that we'll be filled with all joy, joy, an uh, inner sense of peace in the midst of the storm. It's always amazed me that God doesn't take us out of the storm, but he gives us a joy in the middle of the storm. And then uh, a peace, a joy and a peace. I love this concept of peace because I'm a person who likes to try to solve the problem first. And so as I look at my surrounding circumstances, I go to work. And when I realize that my work is not producing any joy or any peace, I then sit down and consider the God of the universe who loves me cares for me, and he is the only source of peace and joy in my life. And so as I go time after time to crisis after crisis, I go back to this little prayer that reminds me that as I trust in God, the God of hope, he will fill me with joy and with peace. 
And it's interesting that joy and peace are a contemporary thing. They happen right now. They happen in the here and the now. But he promises me that if I will be filled with joy and peace because I trust in him, that something else happens. I become overpowered with a sense of hope. And hope is about the future. As we enter the next year, we have no guarantees that things will get profoundly better. They could get profoundly worse. But we have this promise that as we enter the year with joy and peace, that we'll be overwhelmed with hope. And we'll see a world from a different perspective. And what we need today, more than anything, is God's perspective on our surroundings. Not the, the perspective of the country, not the perspective of our politics, not relying on our jobs or who we are, our education, or who we're married to or our wealth, but relying upon the God who loves us, cares for us, who saved us to be a people of hope. And so this hope should pervade our life as we move into the next year. I think of uh, Horatio uh, Schofield who lost his four daughters at sea when he was getting ready to represent D.L. Moody in a, in a campaign in England. And he wrote that great song, All is Well, It is Well with My Soul. Where are we in the storm is an indication of where we are at with the God of hope. He may not be a God of hope for you. And so there may be some soul searching as we seek the scripture, the God of the scriptures, and we apply those truths to our life. For God is anxious to meet us in our time of need and produce hope, produce joy and peace in our lives. So my wish for you for the coming year is that you would discover that God of hope, find that joy and that peace that only he can provide, and that we'll enter the year together with great hope, hope for this church, hope for our community, hope for our lives, as God meets our need in every way. We just praise God for the opportunity to know the God of the universe. Happy New Year. Hi, I'm Lena, and I'm going to talk about the big little moments in our life. Big little moments. You may be wondering, what is that phrase? What is that oxy oxymoronic phrase that she's saying? Well, I made it up. <laughs> big little moments are the blessings you and I experience on our day to day, and that not only deserve God's praise, but to be actively savored and enjoyed by us. There are blessings you and I experience in our present that sometimes we don't acknowledge. We are just a few days into the new year, and if they haven't already been made, there are lists being formulated in our minds of all the things that we can control and change in the new year to be the best versions of ourselves, to be the best versions to face whatever is in store for this year. Although there is merit in placing long-term goals in our lives, 2020 taught me to be mindful of the little moments, the little moments that have a big impact with our relationship with God. Don't get me wrong, if God has put on your heart to have a new resolution for this year, to make a change, or even to have a word to theme this year, Per, please pursue that. In fact, God calls us to glorify him in all that we do and to pursue excellence and to long to do better is essential to glorifying God and adding to his kingdom. However, these New Year's resolutions we all have can be so consuming that we can miss what he's doing in the process and we can miss what he is doing aside from a, for the pursuit of those goals. God does not require monumental accomplishments to be worthy of his love, to be worthy of his blessings, and even his presence. He calls us to believe and abide in him. Last year, because of circumstances out of our control, all of our plans were altered. Where you found yourself, whether it be on one side of the spectrum to 
just needing to change your course or whether you were thriving and suddenly turned to just trying to survive, everything stopped. It was a common experience just to feel stuck, especially when the things in our world would not improve. However, God showed me his faithfulness in so many personal ways that were much powerful than any grand plans that I thought that I had to achieve. I didn't accomplish the things on my list, I'll be honest. And I had to reconcile that. I stressed over it and I grieved over it. But instead, I got to share time with my God. I got to get to know him and be present in the blessings he was providing, although the state in our world was very chaotic. In the message version of Matthew 6:34, it says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. A big little moment I experienced was because of a mountain. My family and I, a couple of months ago, moved out of an apartment that we had been living in for over 15 years. And although it was a change that really needed, needed to happen, I was afraid that home wasn't going to be home anymore, that it wasn't going to feel like my old home was. But one of the things I was most sad about was I was going to lose my mountain. On a road that I would drive down every single day of most of my life, there was a mountain peak that during the winter, it would be snow capped and it was a gorgeous view that God shared with me, that God would give to me every morning and say, this is my creation. It was something I treasured and I wasn't gonna get that anymore. But uh, the other day after it rained, I was driving home to my new place and, and I was just singing in my car, just like a normal day. I was feeling kind of emo, so I was rocking out to some Paramore, but I suddenly stopped because the road had opened up in front of me and a whole mountain range that I didn't even know was there before then was just covered in beautiful snow. My breath was taken away and I had to thank God right then and there for this big little moment he and his creation provided me. I invite you to be present and acknowledge God's faithfulness, not just in the big things like resolutions or pandemics, but the faithfulness he shows us every day. Maybe it's with gratitude lists that you make and you reflect on at the end of the day, or maybe it's sharing it with your brother and sisters in Christ. Or maybe it's as simple as just praying and lifting praise up to God in that moment. Pretty much most of the big things in 2020 left me discouraged, but the little things in my everyday brought life and renewed relationship with my God. By all means, pursue those New Year's resolutions, but remember you are invited to be present and revel in the goodness that God has today. Thank you. Happy New Year, City Line Church. My name is Chad Vandenberg, and I have the opportunity and the privilege to share with you a thought for the new year. Uh, this morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you two different passages from Scripture. And what's interesting about them is that they actually are in chronological order in the book of Luke. Now, throughout history, it has been a common mistake for Christians to take Jesus and kind of morph them into our own image. We find a Jesus who... Uh, has our beliefs, our agendas, and our ideas, and we kind of form him and shape him so that he likes and agrees with the things that we like and agree with. We craft this version of Jesus that says, this group of people is right, and this group of people is shamefully and woefully wrong. We desire a Jesus who aligns with us in our ideas and our agendas instead of us actually aligning to Jesus and his agendas for us. This mistake of crafting Jesus in our own image was 
all too common in 2020. However, it was not the first time in history that that's ever happened. In the book of Luke, we actually see an example of this, and I'd like to share that with you this morning. In Luke 18, verse 35, we have a story of Jesus as he approaches the town of Jericho. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, it says, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what, or who this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out to Jesus saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. They kept shushing him, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that this man be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And listen to this. This is the key portion that I want us to grab. And when all the people saw it, these mobs, these crowds, these followers that were following Jesus, when they saw this, they gave praise to God. Now, the very next verse, chapter 19, verse 1, the story continues. Jesus has now entered Jericho and is passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was very wealthy. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and he was unable to because of the crowd for he was small in stature, he's short. So he ran on ahead of him and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass through. Jesus was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today I must stay in your house. And he hurried and he came down and he received Jesus gladly. And then this is the key verse of this passage. And when they saw it, the people, when they saw this, they all began to grumble saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now it's interesting as we read this passage, as Jesus is approaching Jericho, there's a blind man sitting by the road as they approach the city. He's yelling out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus asks him what's he want and he wants to see and Jesus heals him and the people, they see this. They see the power that Jesus has, that he can give sight to the blind. Could you imagine what he could do as our long awaited Messiah, as our King? He could be extremely powerful. They fit his, that, that fit their agenda and they praised God for it. But immediately in the next passage, we see something that failed to fit their agenda. Jesus enters into Jer Jericho and sitting in a tree as Jesus walks by, trying to get a peek of who this Jesus was, was a man who was despised by the Jews. His name was Zacchaeus. He was seen as a scoundrel, as a thief. He was in cahoots with the Roman government. They would often tax the Jews, taking extra for themselves. They betrayed their own people. They were despised. In their mind, if Jesus was actually doing his job, what he should do is call down fire from heaven and wipe Zacchaeus from the face of the planet. But that's not what he did. He invited Zacchaeus down and said, hey, I'm spending the night at your house and we're gonna eat together. And he actually brought salvation to his house. I think we could plug some of 2020's issues into this story. Jesus, you're gonna eat at the house of a Democrat? How could this be? Do you understand what they stand for? Do you know what kind of beliefs they have? Or Jesus, you're gonna go hang out with Republicans? You're bringing salvation to their house? Do you understand what they believe? How could you do that? There's no way you can do that. How do we get this way as a culture? How does this happen? I would argue that two things are definitely involved. There's probably more. But one is fear and one is confirmation bias. In this day and age, social media platforms and news networks often play into both. They can divide us and they can separate us. They cloud our mind to the point that we no longer see the true version of who Jesus is. And instead, we create this hybrid Jesus that holds to my position and always agrees with me. This year, 2021, my challenge for you 
is to maybe put the phones down a little bit more. Maybe we need to turn off the news networks a little more often. And instead, maybe we need to capture who Jesus Christ is and see the true version untainted by our own agendas and personal beliefs and to find ourselves aligned with him for 2021. Happy 2021, City Line Church. Thank you and God bless. Life is like a box of puzzle pieces. Okay, I know that sounds like a bit of a cliche, but follow along with me for a minute. In puzzles, we have pieces that look pretty boring and bland and like the 20 other pieces you have in a puzzle over there. In life, we have those days or seasons where we feel like nothing exciting is happening. Thankfully, nothing terrible is happening either, but we're kind of on autopilot. Work, eat, sleep, repeat. In puzzles, we also have those pieces where we look at it and we think, is this actually part of this puzzle? Is it really gonna fit here? And in life, we have those, those days and those seasons where we think, how, how is God gonna use this, this piece of my life as part of my story? How is this gonna be part of what he has planned for me? In puzzles, we also have those pieces that look really cool on their own, like this piece, I don't know if you can see, but it has Forky on it, and I really like it, and I don't really need to place it anywhere, I can just look at it. And in life, we're gonna experience those beautiful days and seasons where our worries and our concerns aren't really on our mind and we could live in this moment forever if we wanted to. And the last type of puzzle piece is the lost puzzle piece, where if you finish your puzzle, you're still gonna be fixating on that one piece that's there and it will feel like it's incomplete. In life, unfortunately, we might experience deep pains and terrible losses and as we live our life, we think, I will never be able to recover from that, or I'll never be able to accept that piece that I lost. Well, there are two things that I really like about puzzles. One is the box, because it has the reference picture on it. So I know that if I ever get lost, I can always refer back to it, and I can see where these weird pieces are gonna go. Which brings me to the second thing that I like about puzzles, is that I know that it's all gonna come together. That eventually, I may not have made the puzzle, but eventually I can solve it. Even if I lose a piece, if I really wanted to, I could go back, I could buy another box and find that piece again. Ultimately, I have the control. And that's how I was living my life. If life is like a box of puzzle pieces, that means that I can solve it. So I said, God, I love you, but I got this. I figured out what I wanted my reference picture to be, and I got all of these pieces, the bland ones, the exciting ones, the weird ones, and I tried putting them together. But the more that I was trying to put these puzzle pieces together, the more I realized that it wasn't turning out the way that I wanted it to, the way that my reference picture was. And I got so frustrated because the more I worked on it, it felt like the worst that it got. Sure, there were times when it felt like it was coming together, but essentially it, it, it wasn't turning out the way that I intended it to. Until so eventually it kind of just all came crashing down and I hit what we would consider a rock bottom. And I remember in that moment, my mom telling me, well, Cynthia, all you can do is trust God. And it, it reminded me of Psalm 23, 1, which says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And in that pain, in those tears, I was thinking, well, God, how is this even a verse in the Bible? How can I lack nothing when there's so much pain, when there's so much hurt, when there's so much that I'm actually lacking in my life? And maybe you've experienced a similar, a similar thought or a similar season. And it took time and it took a lot of work, but I realized that life is like a box of puzzle pieces that we were never intended to solve. And I lack nothing doesn't negate anything that we've been going through. It doesn't dismiss the hurt. It doesn't dismiss the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, the abusive relationship, or even a pandemic. But that despite all of that, this puzzle pieces of our lives are being put together by the one who made it. So we can release control of our puzzle pieces to our puzzle maker who has our reference picture in front of him and who knows how and when these pieces are gonna be put together. So I started shifting from attending to making my puzzle to my relationship with my puzzle maker. 2020 has brought a mix of puzzle pieces for all of us and perhaps we may have even lost a piece or two. And as we head into 2021, my hope for us is that we can stop trying to work on our puzzle pieces and instead work on a relationship with our puzzle maker. And how do we do that? Well, first we have to identify what has our attention. 
An author that I'm reading wrote, the most valuable asset we possess is our attention. So what are we attending to? And having an honest conversation of, with ourselves about what that is. After we notice what we're attending to, we have to let go and make room to attend to our relationship with God. And then doing what Matthew 6.33 says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And don't get me wrong, the enemy is observant and he's powerful and he'll notice when we start to take our attention off of our puzzle and off of our, of our lives. And so as we're shifting our attention to our relationship with our puzzle maker, we will encounter opposition. But in those moments, we can stay strong and remember that the Lord is our shepherd. We lack nothing. So this 2020, let's stop focusing our hands and our attention to our puzzle pieces and instead release them in surrender to our God. Thank you. So have you ever thought about how you, you enter a new year? You ever thought about kind of everything that goes into the, the celebration of a new year? I mean, you, you've been there, right? You're, you're counting down. It's five, four, three, two, one. And then suddenly what? There's a celebration that seems to just explode from within. There, there, there's, there's noises and, 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 and loud cheers and screams for, for, for something that, that, is, that we've been anticipating for, for what feels like forever. It's interesting to me that, that, that we, we, we crave the ending of an old year uh, and, and we have so much excitement about this new year. And, and in this excitement about this, this new year, we have in our minds somehow some way that somehow by leaving one year behind, that, that we're going to be able to leap into something totally brand new, something totally different. And, and we think that by, by, by just uh, the page of a calendar turning from one day to another, that, that, that somehow that's our ticket to change. That, that somehow that that's going to be the ultimate do-over. Somehow that's going to be the ultimate difference. That, 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 that suddenly last year is gone and now New Year's, guess what? Well, that's, that's, my, that's my year. It, it, it's now my year. But what's fascinating to me is I think that most of us, we, we run into a problem. That most of us, we, we enter a new year having changed nothing about the way we left last year. I mean, the way that we ended that new year, we, we think that we're, we're moving towards something different, but at the same time, we didn't change anything. So, so why should we actually expect anything different if we've not like refocused our response into the way that this new year is approached. I mean, think about this just for a second. There, there's a, a, a whole chapter in the book of Psalms that has been on my mind all week. It, it's, it's Psalms 100. It, it says this, it says, shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Now just picture that for a second. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. I mean, think about your New Year's celebration and the shouting that, that was there. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing and with joy. It says this in verse three, and I think this is important. Acknowledge that the Lord, he's good. Not just good, but acknowledge that the Lord is God. Now, what's interesting about that is most of the time we want to say, oh, God is so good and God is so great and God, I'm trusting you for what's going on in my new year and God, this is going to be my year. But you know what we like to do? We like to be God. I mean, let's just be honest. If, if we're, we're quite honest with ourselves, when we focus in a new year, our focus is about us. It's about what we want to do. It's about what we think we need. It's about our goals and it's about our dreams and it's about everything that we desire. But yet, but yet here's what we leave out. We leave the presence of God out. That it's easy sometimes to, to transition into something new and leave God out of the picture, that we forget about God's faithfulness in the past, and that doesn't stir up any kind of excitement about what, what could be in our future. Why? Because, well, we're focused on us. The psalmist says that we can worship the Lord with gladness. We can come before him with singing and joy. We can, we can do those things if we're willing to acknowledge that the Lord is God, that he made us, and that we are his, and that we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And then here's how he says, here's what you need to do. You need to enter his gates with thanksgiving, that you go into his courts with praise. Did you hear that? He says, he says if you're going to transition from one thing to another, here's what you need to do. You need to enter, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts 
with praise, to which you might say, well, well, where exactly is God's gates and where exactly is God's courts? It's right where you are. It's right where you are today. See, see, most of us, we, we, want, we want to create an experience. We, we need some sort of, of worship experience or worship moment, or we need God to, to do something big in our life that now generates a response in us to where we want to praise him. But did you hear what the psalmist says? The psalmist says, before God has done anything, before you have seen anything happen in your 2021, before any of your dreams, goals, desires are ever met, he says, here's what you do first. He says, you choose to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise. You recognize that God is God and that you and I, we are not. And so we will thank him in advance. We will worship him in advance. We will praise him in advance before anything ever comes about we will worship God, we will give thanks to him, he says, and we will praise his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. He says, you don't have to wait on some sort of move of God. You don't need to, to create some sort of, of move of God. In fact, you don't need to manufacture anything because God's already at work moving inside of you. That if you said yes to Jesus, he says that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and at well in you. So that means that you can enter God's courts now. You can enter God's gates. You can begin to praise and worship him with all you've got right there where you're at, even in advance of what's to come. Why? Because the Lord, our God, he is God. The Lord, our God, he is good. That, that, that because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done, because he is filled us with his spirit and his power we can expect that things can and will be different but the question is if you've been filled with the power of Jesus Christ in your life what are you doing with it how does this look in your family how does this look in your relationships how does this look in your marriage how does this look as you raise your children how does this look as you serve your church, as you worship your God, as you continue to lead others, as you continue to bring about and instill the change by the power of God that resides inside of you. My encouragement to you as you head into 2021 is that you would not leave God somehow far behind in your 2020. But instead, before you even write the list, instead, before you even create the goal that you would first choose to enter, enter his courts with thanksgiving, that you would enter his gates with praise, that from who you are and all you are, you would praise and glorify God in advance because the presence of God is with you. God is for you. He is our God and he is good and his faithfulness and his love, it lasts from generation to generation. So as we pause and we, we, we think about all that we've heard today, we want to continue to, to lean in and proclaim Jesus as Lord. And the way that we're going to do that is through a time of communion together. Our hope is that you have already found the elements that you need at home, that you would gather whatever it is that you have, and that you would join together as a family as we continue to focus on Jesus in this moment as Pastor Troy leads us in this time. And it's at this point in time that we wanna invite you to get your communion elements ready as we just take a moment to create the space to lean in and observe communion together as a church. And what I love about communion is that it's an opportunity for us to connect and reflect, to, to press pause on all the busyness of life and the season and the things that can come up and to take some time to just kind of lean in and remember our redemption, to remember the, the cost that, that was paid for us and to remember the one thing that unites us and that's Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a wonderful opportunity. And Paul, as he's talking about this, he says this in 1 Corinthians, that the, the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he, he took bread, and when he had broken it, he gave thanks. And, and he said, 
this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. He invites the church to take time to lean into this moment, to observe all that God has done in and through Jesus and to remember that that is the reason that they are where they are and that they are connected in a life-giving Christ-centered community. And it's the same for us. So in the next few moments, we're going to pray and I invite you as we continue to worship to just take communion wherever you are with whatever you have available to you and be sure to, to give thanks, to connect and to reflect on the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your body and your blood that was broken and poured out for us. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you for who you are and all that you are doing. God, I pray that you continue to bring us together, that you continue to build us together, God, as we continue to lean in and to honor you in the way that we live our lives. We thank you for this time of communion, God. We, we pray a blessing over these elements, God, and I pray that you continue to do your work in and through us. In the name of your son, we pray, amen. We thank you, Jesus. Father, may this be our first response. It's running to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. As we run to you, you stand there with open arms, Lord. Bless your name. I've carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it.
run to you, Lord Jesus. Not as a last response, Father, but as a first response, Lord Jesus. May we run to you and only you, Lord Jesus, as we embark on this new year, God. And yes, although the foreseeable future may seem unknown and seem frightening, God, one thing that we do know and one thing that we can bank on, Lord Jesus, is that you are there. You are there, God, with arms open wide, ready to embrace us. And may we run with confidence towards you, Lord Jesus. And maybe even we're running with uncertainty, and maybe with some doubt and some fear. But Lord, as we run to you, Lord Jesus, and as we look and gaze into your eyes and see your arms wide open, Lord Jesus, may these feelings of fear, may these feelings of doubt, may these feelings of uncertainty melt away as we run into your arms and as we're wrapped in your warm embrace, Lord Jesus. So we thank you. We thank you for what 2021 is going to bring, no matter what it may look like. You are consistent. You are faithful, God. And you will always be there and have always been there. As your word tells us, you have never left us or forsaken us. We run to you. We run to you. This first Sunday of the new year, we run to you. This first response, we run to you, God. We run to you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, God. And we give you glory. Thank you for holding us. Thank you for giving us that assurance and that certainty. Father, we love you. Praise and all the glory because you deserve it now and forever. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you want to stay tuned, you can follow us on any of our social media channels. See you next week.